much, Thomas. Thank you for the audience. I'd like, to, first of all, to show you my jacket uh, for our, in honor of our guest from America. For our, I'm happy to be here that we're joining forces now to work together. I think that's only a win. We're all going to win on that. And I think I'm ha very happy to be here today to a little bit discuss research. It's serious, it's not uh, fun. But um, really, how research leads the way to deeper understanding of coffee roasting. I'd like to say here, my, my objective is basically to show that research can actually add value to your businesses. That's more or less what I'd like to do. And, and by that, I'd like also to show you where research is heading currently, what we do. Sometimes a little bit crazy things. In a few years, it will be less crazy. But that's how research is. So research is done all along the value chain. And we heard this morning a lot about the green coffee. Green coffee is something that takes time, it takes a year. Once you roast the coffee, things get suddenly very, very fast. You have just a few weeks between your roasting all the way to your cup, your consumption. It depends on the philosophy of the people. Two days, four days, a few weeks. But definitely, the second part of the value chain is something that goes extremely fast. And I call that the phase of the transformations. And that's where, as the SEAE, and we have now created a new research committee, we have de decided currently to focus on, on the transformations, from the roasting all the way to the cup. And that's also traditionally where the European industry is strong at. We have a lot of strong roasting industry, as we have just seen, also in the grinding era, in the coffee machine era. There's a lot of industry in, in the European scene. And so I think that's a natural way to address the transformation as a focus in the research committee of, Euro of Europe. And to look at pros that are very fast, we also need a technology that is looking at these processes in a time-resolved manner. So you want to introduce time as a real measurement factor in your science in order to point out that things are happening fast and you have to see these things. So science has been introducing techniques that are fast, but first, I also would like to say, when I talk about roasting, we have to take a broader perspective of roasting. Roasting, of course, is the roasting machine, but more and more, a roaster also does a conditioning of his beans. He does preheat, he does selection. There is a lot coming before the roasting, and today, a roaster needs to know that. A roasting is embedded in a whole value chain, and so you have to integrate what comes in, and once you roast it, you have another process. You have the cooling, and of course, also the freshness playing an important role. And degassing aspects are also now part of the worries of roaster and all the coffee industry. And I'd like to say a few things also about that, about the aspect of degassing, which means uh, loss of freshness, actually. I'd like to talk about freshness. And freshness is one of the major themes of also of the specialty coffee of Europe, because I believe, or we believe, that uh, specialty coffee is something that wants to be consumed fresh. And we want to move away from a shelf life product with long shelf product with long shelf life to products consumed fresh. But in order to, to uh, master that, you have to measure freshness. You have to know what freshness is. As long as you don't know what freshness is, you will never be able to really grab that notion of freshness. So I will talk, talk about that too. Now green coffee. Green coffee, nothing, green coffee has nothing from what we experience in our flavor experience. Only when you roast it, you generate all your aromas. Different chemical processes, very complex, but there are something like 30 compounds. Sometimes people say coffee has 1,000 aroma compounds. That's not true simply, and you know, I repeat that. Coffee does not have 1,000 aroma compounds, 1,000 volatile compounds. Out of that, only 30 have a flavor. All others are just volatile. You don't smell, are below threshold. So coffee has really only 30 aroma compounds, and we shouldn't be ashamed to say that because these 30 compounds are very complex and it's the balance between the 30 compounds that create the aroma. And it's not 1,000, it's just one thing. But now, how do you understand the formation? Today we know very little about the formation of coffee aroma compounds. And this is happening, of course, when you roast. Here's a typical experiment situation. On one hand, you have a roaster. We did experiments with different roasters, not just with this one. And then when you roast, inside the roaster, the aroma develops. Now, what we want to have, and I just said that earlier, 
we want to look now time resolve. We want to introduce time into our analytics, into our measurement, to our science. So what we do in the off gas, when the gas goes out, we have here basically the whole aroma that is generated in the roasting. You pull it out and kiss out. So if with a tubing, you analyze online the composition of all these compounds online with a resolution of one second, of course you need technology, you need methods for that. But we have that. And you're observing basically the roasting, not just with the roast profile that people do with Cropster or this kind of technologies. You really observe the composition of the aroma that is generated and that is uh, probed here with the technology. And you look here, whatever that is, the mass spec, you don't need to know more, but all the flavor compounds are there. And you look at the evolution of the flavor compounds as a function of time, and you're basically observing the roasting happen. Out of that, you can determine a lot of things. That's how you can address dynamic processes. Of course, you can take samples all along the roasting to measure the roast degree. Basically, in this kind of setup, you have to stop the roasting and measure it, and do the sensory profile. And then what you can do with mathematical techniques, uh, it's a multidimensional correlation, you can correlate a profile that is like that with the roast degree or with the sensory profile. And while observing this profile and with these mathematical techniques, you can actually know what roast degree is in the roaster. So you're looking online, not just as a cropster profile, but you have a much more direct view of what you care about, is the aroma. So I'd like to show you first a few experiments, not determining roast degree, but roasting single origins. It's a big issue, do you want to blend before or after? What's the benefit? I'm just showing you one example, and then you can think yourself a little bit what, where does this lead. Here I'm showing just three pure agents. This experiment we did at Probat. We did many more. I'm just showing three typical, a Colombian, a Guatemalan, and a Ethiopian coffee. And we are roasting this. I call that standard. It's a 12-minute roast at a medium roast temperature. So what you see is that the Guatemalan after six, seven minutes, in the off gas, you start to observe this specific flavor compound. I'm not saying what it is, it's just one flavor compound that we picked out. You see it starts to appear, it goes up, now it reads the roast degree of 100. This is a medium roast degree, it's a colorette. You stop the roasting. That's why you don't have any more, so you, you dump the coffee out. For the Colombian, it takes you a little bit, one minute longer. For the Yirga Jefe, you have to go to 14 minutes to reach the same roast degree. And the way the aroma forms is actually different. You know, it forms and then it's more or less in a plateau. Now, you want to roast these three coffees, but you reduce the roaster temperature. You do it slower. What happens? Does this order stay or does it change? Well, I don't think it's difficult to predict, but what we're doing now is reduce the temperature of the roaster. We're roasting again to the exact same roast degree. Nothing changing. It's just longer. What we see now suddenly that Ethiopian coffee, who was the last, suddenly is the first. And also, they are much closer together. There are many things you see here. So that basically, the temperature at which you roast will actually change the dynamics of the roasting process. And you also see that, for example, here at the slower temperature, you can actually reach the same roast degree for all three coffees in a much more accurate way than if you do it fast. And somewhere here, perhaps you would have an overlap. So essentially, we're looking directly by looking at the aroma compounds. You can do it differently, but we're seeing poor origins. We're seeing also other things. For example, if you would roast these two together, this one would reach medium roast degree. This one hasn't even started roasting. It's still a green coffee. Basically, with these techniques and with sensory and addition, we're trying to explore what are the sweet spots of roasting pure origins. Can you reach some sensory domains that you will never be able to reach by doing the blending? And what are these domains? This is kind of an orientation in this era. Another era we do, these are now again same traces, and we want to control the roast degree online. So we want to observe. And here I'm taking just two compounds. This is now hot air, medium and lower temperature of, of the gas, and roast it to a light, medium and dark roast light, medium, dark roast, and we're observing the formation of these compounds in the gas coming out. So if we go a little bit further, it matches the same curve, but you have a little bit longer. These are the curves. Now, 
what we studied is we looked at all these 100 compounds and we found that there are 25 different profiles. Some compounds form like that, others have very different. We're always roasting to the light, medium and dark. And here is essentially we're looking at 25 coffee aroma compounds that are formed. For a while, nothing happened. After the half of time, suddenly you start some compounds appearing. And when you do statistical analysis with these compounds, the profiles early on, later on, then you can basically predict the roast degree you're observing because you take samples at all different times, you term the roast degree, you calibrate your, your spectra, and then with something we call the principal component analysis, when you roast, you are observing the trajectory of your 25 compounds. In this type of analysis, you project all 25 compounds to one point in three-dimensional space. It's a little bit complex, but while you start roasting, this is the profile is uh, condensed into one point, and then at some point it comes through this calibration point, and you know when it walks through here, that's the profile, the match, it has this roast degree, and then you have it. And this is with the medium hot air temperature, this is really hot, and this is a little bit cooler. You see the trajectories are a little bit different depending on whether you uh, roast with hot air or a little bit less hot air. And you can already imagine that if you roast like that, you have the same roast degree, but the sensory profiles are different. Now, how is a sensory profile different at, say, at the medium roast degree if you do fast or slow? Most people might have a guess, so we just measured it. And here, for example, a medium roast degree, three coffees, and you just look at the blue trays. And this one is roasted slowly, and this one is roasted fast with a hot air temperature. What is the difference in the sensory profile, if you look at the blue? If you ro roast fast, but always the same roast degree, what you see is that you have been able to preserve acidity, and you don't have really much roasty note. I'm sorry for the German, but just to practice a little bit German here. Roast degree and bitterness. Whereas here, if you do the same roast degree, but you have done it slower, you really lost much of this acidity and have a different profile. Overall, what we observe is if you roast slow, you have less intensity. That's overall the observation. You lose actually intensity. But in the profile, it's what you would expect. You always lose acidity if you go slow. You have a little bit more acidity if you go with a high speed, the same roast degree. And so we're exploring now this profile roasting, as it has been mentioned. Profile roasting is a very important subject that we work. How does the, the technology impact? And here I'd like to say something that we heard this morning, very interesting discussion. What is specialty coffee? Specialty coffee has a lot to do, in my opinion, with transformation and processing. It has to do with variety also, but really specialty coffee has a lot to do with mastering all steps of the selection uh, and also the agronomy and the transformation. So here is a part of specialty coffee by mastering roasting. You can actually move from specialty to non-specialty. So uh, another experiment, like a crazy one, roasting is actually, when you have one kilo of bean, you have 5,000 beans. But really what you do is you roast 5,000 beans the same way. So if you want to, want to really study as a scientist now, which I am, I want to understand the roasting. Why should I study 1,000 beans? I just take one bean, and I roast one bean because this bean must contain all the information that is happening in the 1,000 that repeat each other. And perhaps information is more finer, is more exact. So the way things work, you can roast a single bean, and you can even drill a small hole in it and probe the bean inside. And you're observing the aroma formation on a single bean because it's really the single bean is the unit of roasting, and it shows all the roasting properties. And what we have here is basically a fine capillary, and then we pull it the air out here, and we measure the compounds that are coming out, and you can actually study the single bean. And why should you study 1,000 beans and average all out if you can do the single? And what we see here, and I don't want to go into chemistry, but here, for example, are several compounds we see appearing in the roast gas. Some come early, and then later and later and later. And actually, if we look at the chemistry and don't even try to understand now, we know, we can understand, we can actually understand the chemistry that actually this one gets created 
And in this chain, we understand how these flavor compounds are formed, because you see that this one comes further, this one later, and actually there is a mechanical connection between both. So you can actually, by looking at the dynamics of flavor formation, you can also understand the mechanism of their formation. And that's one of the advantages of this dynamic information, because you see things happen, and you see the link if you have a little bit chemical understanding. And that's done on a single bean, you can do it on a whole batch, you see the same information. Now, the last experiment I want to show, not very well, it's very recent. All the one that I showed now has been published, and that's one also of the objectives that we'd like to do in Specialty Coffee Association of Europe. We want to base our statements on work that has been peer-reviewed, so that is not anecdotal, that is basically also um, something people can read on. This one is just very recent, and also not very top, but this is another way of understanding the chemistry. We roast under nitrogen or under air. And these are repetition. For example, here, you see these are four times roasting. Repetibility of our roaster in nitrogen and air is not super, but uh, we can improve. But you see the formation of some compounds is different in air than in nitrogen. And some compounds actually are more formed in nitrogen, but actually we see you have a high intensity when you roast under air versus under nitrogen. And if we look at this coffee after two weeks of storage, these differences are amplified even a little bit. This kind of experiment, it's a little bit, it's not meant to be, to build a roaster that throws on the nitrogen, but you understand the chemistry, because you understand in this compound, oxygen is involved and how it is formed, and you can then eventually better tailor your roasting process. A lot of compounds are not affected by the atmosphere, only a few. And in fact, there are good reasons why the atmosphere does not so much affect. Once you roast, you have a coffee that is fresh. And what we want is to serve fresh coffee. Now, how do you measure freshness? That's another story that a roaster might think about, because you want to bring the quality of your roasted coffee all the way to customer. But we talk about freshness, but how do you address freshness? How do you measure it? Now, y there are actually two ways to measure freshness. The very obvious one is to measure the aroma as a function of time, and you see how it evolves, and somehow you develop some numbers with which you quantify the freshness. We call that freshness indices. Or another way of observing freshness is the CO2. CO2 is generating the coffee, and while it ages, you lose CO2. So measuring the amount of CO2 in your bean is another way of measuring freshness. I call one the physical marker and the chemical marker. This is the chemical marker, the aroma marker, and you can measure both, and we do measure both, in order to address freshness as one of the key quality of specialty coffee. Chemical marks, I don't want to go too much. These two curves are basically repetition. These are two coffees that has been roasted separately and stored, and we're here talking about the four-week storage. The way we, we address storage is by taking two compounds that are in part of the coffee aroma. And we don't measure the absolute, but we measure the ratio, the proportion of each two. And we define it as a freshness index. It's not something we invent, it exists in literature, we just refined it. And you observe the ratio of dimethyl disulfide, is a compound divided by methanthiol. Methanthiol is a compound that marks freshness. You will not find the methanthiol in old coffee. And if you plot this ratio, and we do this repetition, you see that this ratio goes up. And by that, you can have actually a direct measure of the freshness of your coffee. The compound dimethyl disulfide hardly exists in fresh coffee. It is formed to oxidation. Methanthiol gets down, you get the ratio. And this is a way to measure freshness. And you can actually also look at the impact of temperature. You store a 22 degree. These are whole beans stored in a regular aluminum with a filter, with a, with a valve in it. And you see that going to 55 degree, you have a huge acceleration of this aging or whatever loss of freshness. Another way to look at freshness is, as I said, and there are many ratios like that, but I just wanted to show you the principle, is to measure the loss of gas. Here is the setup, and here is the volume inside, and you feel freshly roasted coffee inside, and then you measure the loss of weight. Here, the setup, there's a small capillary here. The CO2 is physical weight. If you degas, you will lose weight, and you measure that way directly the CO2, and you measure the loss of freshness. It's actually the most direct. And this is a balance, it's sitting on the balance, and it's inside a, a room that is temperature stabilized, 
and I just want to show you what it gives, you know, and how much gas is actually in a coffee. Now, a little bit, what is in the coffee? When you have green coffee, you have 12% humidity, you have zero CO2. The green coffee has no CO2. You roast it, you end up with approximately 2% of the weight of your bean is CO2. And the same is water, just uh, by chance. When you keep it a little bit as whole bean, it doesn't degas much. Really, this part here, about 70% of the gas is lost during grinding. Grinding is that step which releases the most of the CO2. Here is actually the grinding dynamics of a whole bean. Now, how fast does a whole bean degas? This is measured. We have repetitions. I'm showing just one here. We have a degassing here that is happening after 15 days. You have lost 1% of your weight. So if you're a smart uh, specialty coffee roaster, you sell your coffee fast because you're losing weight and you can sell more coffee. So after 10 days, 15 days, you lost 1% of your weight, you have lost 1% of your benefit. But that's more or less what you lose when you degas whole beans. It's a 1% weight in 15 days. Now, if you grind it, that's another interesting experiment, last one that I'm showing for Arabica, the impact of roast degree. If you have 170, that's a really light roast. This is colorette, it's a light roast. You have a dynamics. The dynamics is different. You see you have a lot, and then you have going on. This is a one week. We're measuring the weight loss during one week. And then you have a darker roast. It goes up. You have more and more. That's more or less logical that you have more degassing if you go darker and darker and darker. But what you see here already, and you will see it better in the Robusta case, at some point, there is no more gas. It starts to level off. So starting at the medium roast degree of 90, you don't add any more gas. What's happening actually after the first crack, you're starting to degas already during roasting, and at the end of your roasting, you don't have more. For the Robusta, it's even uh, more visible. Here, you roast, get 99, that's a medium roast degree. Then you go to a darker, and here, you see that at some roast degree, you don't add more gas in your product. And what you see actually even here is that if you go to very dark coffee, you have a different structure. The degassing happens fa faster, and at the end, you don't have more. You have even less. So it's not that you add more and more CO2. At the medium roast degree, you have a level. You start to level off, and the dynamics start to change, and you have a much faster release. This is actually... CO2 measurement, it's very important in many perspectives. And what we see, of course, quite obvious, if you measure Robusta for a light roast degree and you go darker, darker, at some point, the amount of gas that it can release in 90 days levels off for Arabica also, but the whole value, you have less gas in Arabica, you degas less. And the same thing is here, it's, it's leveling off. Basically, statements, medium roast, that's where you have the maximum we generate. And of course, degassing is a measure of freshness, but also it's, it's a potential for the crema. If you extract it properly, that's the only way you can create crema. And another, of course, objective of understanding degassing is to understand how to package your coffee properly, particularly for capsule systems, for single-serve systems. It's a very important measure. So I'd like to thank all the people who helped. And also, the single bean roasting was done with uh, Professor Raf Zimran. Thank you very much. <laughs>